Chattanooga, Tennessee. My name is Ed Mena, and I'm proud to be representing the growling saxophone designed by master Melvin Quinones. Um, they had asked me to do a short video uh, on some tips and tricks. I don't know about tricks um, because there are no shortcuts with playing correctly. And um, so I wanted to go over some of the things that I still practice, that I've been shown uh, over the years. I did write notes, and uh, I'm going to be looking down at them to make sure that I, I do cover the things I wanted to cover. Um, so the first thing I, I do go over with my students uh, is, when they come to me for the first time, is to developing a practice routine. It's so important to know what you're going to cover before you go over it. Uh, it's basically like uh, an exercise routine. If you're going to work your, your shoulders or your upper body as opposed to your legs, you know what you're going to work on before you, you, you uh, work on it. Um, and developing that routine is pretty much like uh, good hygiene or, you know, brushing your teeth uh, regularly, you know, once a week. Uh, but in any event, you know what I'm, I'm getting at. Um, I've had great teachers from the beginning, and uh, what I'm going to show you is what they've shown me, and uh, obviously with my spin on it. Um, by God's grace, I've been very successful, or better yet, my students have been very successful uh, in making... All state and honor bands and uh, full scholarships to uh, various music schools. Uh, even I've had several students make the uh, Downbeat uh, Award for the outstanding best jazz alto saxophone in the United States. I've had that uh, twice. I've had three students make the Grammy Band uh, in Los Angeles on their um, that was aired on television. Uh, and these are students who obviously listened to what I said and applied what I um, showed them. Uh, another important factor in those, with those students, they, they did listen to the recording of their lesson. I would always have a recording uh, of their lesson, and they would go home and listen to it and double-check what I said, how they sounded, because listening to yourself is crucial. It's hearing those things you, you want to work on. Uh, you never want to work on things that make you sound good. Uh, you, I've had a teacher tell me you should never like the way you sound in a practice room. Okay, going on. The number one thing I go over is developing a practice routine. And the practice routine is basically your tonal studies, and your finger studies. The tonal studies, obviously working on your sound and your timbre, your intonation, and finger studies to develop your fingering technique. Uh, tonal uh, control is also a technique. But your uh, fingering technique uh, is obviously a very important part of that. Um, we did talk about, I did mention listening to yourself. Uh, I tell my students that it's, it's basically, I don't want my read to dry out. Uh, I don't want, uh, I want to train them to actually be their own teacher. So when they're listening to themselves, they say, oh man, I need to do that again, or I need to play it slower. Striving for perfection. Uh, you always want to focus on your weaknesses and manage your strengths. Um, so this is important. At, uh, to think about as you progress through your practice routine. Um, okay, listening to yourselves. Patience. Um, <laughs> you're looking at one of the most impatient people in the universe. Um, but at 65, I've, I'm a little more patient. But
but you need to realize that, again, like a relationship, things that are of value, they do take time. And uh, at 65, I'm still striving to, to work on being a better player. And this is for the love of making music, nothing else. I spend and encourage my students to spend only about eight to 10 minutes on their tonal studies and with their fingering studies, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, there are other fish to fry. And again, it's your daily um, routine of going through these various studies. And of course, there's also sight reading and listening and, and transcribing uh, the, for those of you who are focusing on, on jazz studies. Um, listening is so important, not only to your own instrument, but other instruments. My teacher at the university, my, my first teacher at the U of M uh, was Kirby Campbell, played with the Jackie Gleason Orchestra. And he had me listen to Yasha Heifetz and Itzhak Perlman. These, these concepts were to address intensity uh, in, 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 the, in the phrasing and playing, uh, as well as a vibrato. Um, so again, you're not only going to listen to saxophone players. Uh, time management. It's very important that if you only have, you know, I encourage the serious students to spend at least, at least two, at least two hours a day, uh, maybe with one day off. Um, but if you only have due to homework or other uh, obligations, if you only have uh, 40 minutes, you know, then kind of isolate the things that give you the most challenge and concentrate on those. Uh, make sure, okay, uh, I have here, strive to get a great teacher. I encourage a lot of, uh, when I taught school, I taught school for about 32 years, I was a band director, uh, those who wanted private lessons uh, to call the local university and if they can't get a hold or go to the professor of saxophone there, they might have some graduate assistants who are good in teaching and uh, would enjoy teaching you. So again, strive to get not a great player because not all great players are great teachers. You need somebody to be able to transfer and help you internalize the concepts of becoming a great player. Also, um, make sure you have a tuner and a metronome in that practice room, along with your pencil to mark parts and uh, make notes of things that you need and want to work on. Um, okay, the first thing I go over in the tonal studies are the harmonics and overtones. These exercises help you open up your throat, um, help with uh, breath capacity, uh, and your uh, intonation. So uh, I probably said intonation. All right. I'm going to be making mistakes here and there with this. I've already tried about five times to make this video and I tripped over my words and started again. So there's going to be tripped over words and repeated things and maybe even things that I leave out. But again, I hope this does help you. Um, all right. The harmonics are based on the fundamental uh, of low B flat, B, C, C sharp, and D. Uh, and these uh, this exercises I was given are based off the Sigurd Rascher uh, book called Top Tones for Saxophone, a very important book for serious saxophone students. I wish I still had mine. I lent it to one of my students. Can't remember who that was and never got it back. But once you gain control of the fundamental, for example, playing a low B flat, and I got to share this story. There was a great uh, saxophone player, um, Ward Smith from the University of Miami. To me, he sounded like a Michael Brecker on saxophone. But when we were in our lessons, our, our teacher, Kirby Campbell, had him playing low B flats, B, C, C sharps, and low Ds for almost the entire 16 week semester. Uh, so it is so important to be able to have control of your instrument. So when you play a low note, hopefully the reed hasn't dried out. 
You don't have to honk it or squawk it or just get air. So uh, obviously you want to fill up with uh, a big breath of air. I usually have my students um, isolate the fundamental and the first partial or overtone, which is an octave above. Now, since I'm using my phone for doing this video, I don't have my, my tuner out. But always line up your pitch and strive for the center of that tuner. I use a, a Peterson strobe tuner. It cost me about $9, uh, but that's a great tuner. Uh, the majority of them are free, and they do a great job, but make sure you use one. After the fundamental and the uh, first partial, you then breathe. This I'm having difficulty uh, connecting the fundamental of low B flat to uh, the first partial. Connect it like the B and the C come out. I then have them progress to the second partial, which is a fifth above the first partial. So on low B, the second partial will, partial will be an F sharp. And when you do this exercise, you want to play it as long as possible. Uh, I do encourage sometimes putting your metronome on to be aware of how many beats, how many seconds you can hold it and strive to increase your breath capacity. shows you why I still practice those because I'm still gaining and, and desiring to gain control of those upper partials. Uh, this exercise does help to open your throat so that when you go over the break uh, going into the altissimo you can go uh, you can achieve that smoothly and with control. A lot of young students, they want to play in the upper register and they end up closing their throat and biting and getting a squeak noise. Uh, and that's not the way to uh, play in the altissimo register. But this exercise helps you get up there. I remember Kirby telling me, if you can play a B-flat scale slurred uh, one octave, you know, going into the altissimo, your throat is open. So again, this harmonic studies uh, exercise has helped to keep your throat open. up there with your throat open uh, kind of gets, you know, lets you know that your throat is uh, getting open. Another way to practice these exercises are in front of the mirror. So you're going to want to actually see your throat expand when it's open. <laughs> too much fat around my neck. You can't see my throat open, but uh, the throat does kind of expand a bit. Um, okay, after spending, uh, you know, some time on that, the second version of this harmonic exercise I call matching. And what you're in essence doing is matching the intonation and the timbre, you know, the overall quality of the sound uh, of the regular fingering to 
the harmonic, which is fatter and meatier and sometimes more in tune. So matching, you could follow the overtone series going from the first partial, second, and third, and the fourth, if you're ready for it, and put the regular fingering in between. So I'm going to play the partial, the regular fingering, back to the partial. Now the second partial. Now the third partial. Then you can do it in a scalar uh, fashion. For example, here's the chromatic scale. Now for D, E flat, and E, I use false fingerings. Just for the effect. Now I'm back to F, which is the low B flat fundamental. Now you notice the regular fingering was a little bit sharp, so I'm going to lower my jaw and match that fingering. Uh, match the intonation with the uh, with the harmonic. You get the idea, and you want to build dexterity. And I've actually used these in an improv situation, uh, you know, obviously much faster. I realize I'm, I'm almost at uh, 17 minutes here. Uh, Melvin said about a 15 to 20 minute video. The next thing is obviously your finger studies. And with your finger studies, um, you want to do your scales, your patterns like thirds and fourths and, uh, you know, diatonic sevenths. There are so many. There's such a myriad of uh, method books that you could get. Again, a good teacher is going to recommend whether you're doing the universal method. Uh, I remember at the U of M, I, I, I loved working out of the Guy Lacour uh, study book. And again, there's so many not to even uh, waste the time to mention any more. Um, but when doing the scales and beginning the uh, work on your finger studies, again, don't play fast. You want to strive for perfection. So start slow. I have, uh, I've had the, the privilege of studying with Gary Campbell. Again, he was uh, one of the authors for the Patterns for Jazz book, and he was my student, uh, he was my uh, teacher at the University of Miami. And he got me to do this. I set my metronome at 60, and I would play the scale at quarter notes at 60, keeping it at 60. Quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets, 16th notes, 16th note triplets, and then 32nd notes. And when you can do that and you're playing with control and not sweating it, uh, you can move it to 61. Um, but you're, again, your scales should be played slurred and full register. So that means instead of playing... <laughs> You're playing all the way up. So quarter notes, here's an example.
way down to B flat. Then an eighth note. Then in triplets. And then in sixteenths, quarter. Uh, here's. Uh, let me try and embarrass myself with the sixteenth note triplets. minor now in listening to yourself that break where I made a mistake I would apply I would apply a five finger exercise so I just take those five notes play that five note segment starting stupid slow and gradually playing it only as fast as you can play it evenly. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, what I showed you, again, this is such a drop in the bucket uh, of what needs to be done. But again, the most important uh, asset in playing is your sound. It's your voice and it's what you're going to be recognized by. Um, and I do hope this does help you. God bless you and have a safe and prosperous uh, 2021. Bye.